Hi, thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm dressed a little casually. I hope you won't mind. I think that God likes to have us worship no matter what we're wearing or nothing at all. You're worshiping at home. No one ever knows what you're wearing. Listen, um, the question for today, because we're going to be talking about changes and rummage sales. So the question to think about today is when was the last time that you contributed things to a rummage sale? What kinds of things did you get rid of? I'd like you to think about that for a minute, and you can even hit the pause button if you want. Mostly, though, I want to know what did it feel like when you were getting rid of those things. So I invite you to hit the pause button when you're ready to move on from that. Release the pause button, and you'll hear me today doing the call to worship. All right? Here you go. Ready? Pause. Please join me in our call to worship today by reading in unison with me as you see it on the screen. God chose the people of Israel to make a new beginning. They received God's covenant and prepared the way for Jesus to come as our Savior. God chooses people and faith communities to be partners in this covenant. Our God is still creating new life, new us, and new covenants. Let us worship the God of the covenant, the God of heaven and earth. We have two scripture readings today. The first from the Old Testament comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 27 to 34. I'm reading from the Living Bible. Listen for the word of God. God says, The time will come when I will greatly increase the population and multiply the number of cattle herd in Israel. In the past, I painstakingly destroyed the nation, but now I will carefully build it up. The people shall no longer quote this proverb, children pay for their father's sins. The day will come, says our God, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A contract they broke. But this is the new covenant I will make with them. I will inscribe my laws upon their hearts, so that they shall want to honor me. Then they shall truly be my people, and I will be their God. At that time it will no longer be necessary to admonish one another to know God, for everyone, both great and small, shall really know me then, says the Creator, and I will forgive and forget their sins. Our second reading, the Gospel reading, comes to us today from the Gospel according to Luke, the first eight verses of chapter 18. I'm reading from the Good News Translation. Listen for the Spirit stirring within you as I read. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, Help me against my opponent. For a long time the judge refused to act, but at last he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, Yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord continued, Listen to what that corrupt judge said. Now, will God not judge in favor of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. But will the Son of Humanity find faith on earth when he comes? 
Behold, the Spirit's word for the church today. Thanks be to God. I want you to bear with me a little while. It, it may take a few minutes for me to tie this back around to Scripture, but I promise that will happen. Uh, about 20 years ago, the late historian Phyllis Tickle put forth an observation about the history of the Eurocentric world, the history of humanity that, of course, includes the history of the Christian church. Every 500 years, give or take a half century, she says, a series of events happens that changes the world across all disciplines, geopolitical, math and science, the arts, religion and philosophy. And when that happens, whether people are aware of it or not, it's like we hold a giant rummage sale to get rid of all the things that don't fit anymore. Old beliefs, understandings, the way we look at ourselves. The birth of Jesus was one of those points. And 500 years after that, during the waning days of the Roman Empire, church leaders met and codified what it meant to be a Christian in the world. That had a huge impact on the development of countries and alliances all across Europe. 500 years later, around the year 1000, there was the separation of the Roman-based church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Those two power bases were developing, and that had a huge effect on governments, on education, on travel, and the arts. The Crusades, the Knights Templar, Marco Polo bringing back information from Asia. There's a lot of consolidation of power and knowledge that took place during those 500 years. The next 500-year period brings us up to the Protestant Reformation. Now, that directly influenced the development of the printing press, which just exploded all kinds of knowledge. It brought about the Age of Exploration, the Age of Enlightenment, of revolution, and constructing a new world order where human rights were believed to be given by the Creator. That would be from 1500 to 2000. Each one of these periods is known as a period of emergence because a whole new way of being emerged as a result. Home life, commerce, science, the art of warfare, the sense of the earth being round and how we saw ourselves, how we defined ourselves. Everything changed every 500 years. Now, we were all born during that time, the 500 years from the 16th century through the 20th century. Just think about all the change and development, the, the new ways of thinking, the basic understanding of life and disease and mental illness, of community, of government, of education, the Industrial Revolution, our entire nation's history the ways we define ourselves, the role and rights of women, of people of color, and religion. All that changed during that time. It has been a sea change for Western culture. In our lifetime alone, the emergence of technology, the internet, the smartphone, instant communications, it's overwhelming. Not to mention world wars, the development of weaponry. We have reached the point where we can, we can all annihilate everything on the face of the planet. And here we are now at another 500-year point of emergence. The year 2000, give or take a few decades, is ushering in the next 500-year period. It's one thing to look back on all those changes and those revelations and those emerging things. It's another to try to navigate them in real time. So what are we going to get rid of in this 500-year rummage sale? 
what ideas or beliefs, what attitudes or ways of doing things are you ready to jettison in order to declutter humanity? What are the things you want to take with you? What is, is coming your way or our way as we move forward? We don't know. That's the thing. We can see it either as part of the problem or as part of the excitement. In a 2013 panel discussion, theologian Brian McLaren and this historian Phyllis Tickle were both asked about what they saw as the future of the church, what was starting to emerge from this time. And McLaren explained that for some believers, this is a very dark and cloudy time for the church. We see membership dropping, churches closing. We can get really depressed and, and down about it. For others of us, it's a time of bright excitement and opportunity. God is doing a new thing altogether. Remember, he says, that Christianity grew most rapidly. It flourished when it was a persecuted minority. He went on to say, in all sectors of the church, Catholic, mainline Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal, ethnic churches, peace churches, we have similar stresses going on. The world is changing really fast. People are trying to figure out how to adjust, and none of our churches are doing that well, he says. Then he continued, well, you know, for a while we thought, oh, the mainline Protestants are struggling, the Catholics are struggling, but the Evangelicals are fine. And that's not true either. They're struggling too. And there are all kinds of signs of desperation in the Pentecostal world as well. So we're all in this time of stress. There are groups of people who say what we need to do is exactly what we are doing, just do it harder and better. There's another group of people who say, that says we need to do what we were doing 100 or 500 or 800 years ago. Double down on that. And then there's a third group of people that says, I don't know what to do. Do you? And when those people get together, he says, from that third group, the interesting thing is a Catholic, a Baptist, Pentecostal, whoever it is who comes around the table, who are all asking that question, what are we going to do? They have a really nice dinner party and a really nice discussion. They get along with each other better than they do with other people in their tradition who are either digging in their heels or moving backward. So to me, it's the conversation that is saying, what will, be, what will the Christian faith be in 30 or 50 or 70 years? In all likelihood, it will be quite different from what it is now. And so he ends by saying, let's work together and try to help that be a positive change. We are the emergent church, you and I as long as we're asking that question. Whether we want to be or not, it's where God has placed us. Whether we're thinking about ourselves as being tiny churches that travel around everywhere inside of us, like I preached about a few weeks ago, or we're really bold and audacious and we intentionally push up against the church as it has always been. This 500 year change is happening. And for centuries, people have read and heard this story about the persistent widow. I told you I'd tie it into scripture. This story about the persistent widow who kept at the judge. And they've pictured themselves as being the widow who kept praying no matter what. She wouldn't give up. She never, ever, ever let go of her focus. But what if we aren't the widow in this story? What if we are the corrupt judge? I mean, really, each one of us is human. We're frail. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So what if the persistent widow is God? And what if God just keeps coming back to us time and again and again and again in order to get us to act, to do something 
the way the widow kept after the judge to act, to do something. I mean, there's a part of me that thinks about this in terms of Jeremiah talking to the people in exile, which we kind of are in our culture, aren't we? What if God is longing to make a new covenant with us? But we keep looking back to the way things were before, to what church used to be. Like the sins of the fathers, the old definitions of the church, maybe, you know? What would this new covenant even look like? Does God still make covenants with people? Well, I say yes. Jesus is the new covenant. And if we believe, as we say that we do, that we are new people altogether in Christ Jesus, then we are part of that new covenant. So the covenant, the sacred agreement, lives on through Jesus and into me and into you. And through that, God says, I will inscribe my laws upon your heart so that you shall want to honor me. And then you shall truly be mine, and I will be your God. This is kind of like a targeted message from God to us, that the world is changing, so the church has to change. We are changing, so our relationship with God has to change. And every time that we refuse to do that, every time that we try to hold on to the old ways of thinking or the old ways of doing things, God is going to find another way to come back and press us a little harder, just like that persistent widow did with the judge. And finally, we'll just get so tired <laughs> that we'll just give in to shut the widow up, or in this case, God. Wouldn't it be great if we could get the message sooner? Get the message to do this without going through all that upset? Wouldn't it be great if we could just say, okay, something new is coming. I don't know what it is. Put me where you want me, God, and show me what to do, and I'll go with you. If the church is to survive and the teachings of Jesus are not to be lost to history, then we must become the emergent church of the 21st century. It's on us. It's happening on our watch. It's our duty, our calling. And that's what we signed up for when we joined the church. Now, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know what it's not going to look like. I know it's not going to look like what it is now. Because if it were meant to be what is now, if that's what the church is meant to be, it would be working, and it's not. So it's meant to be something different. How long, oh Lord, how long are we going to stay supporting something that just isn't working? And I can ask that question about our troubled communities, about our school systems, about our prison systems, about our government, and about our churches, our beliefs. We are at the 500-year point, and it's time for the rummage sale. What are you going to get rid of? What are you going to let go of, divest yourself of, free yourself up from? The world is a-changing. I think it's time we started sorting things out. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Holy One, we come before you as diverse people. We may not know each other or each other's names right now, but you know us all and you call us by name and you write on our hearts your love for us. And we're struggling as a people, 
as a nation, as families, as a church. We are struggling in this 21st century. We long to do what you would have us do, to be the faithful followers that you call us to be. And it's hard. Sometimes it's really, really hard to step out in faith when we can't see where we're going, to let go of how things have always been done, of how comfortable we were with them. There's a part of us that longs for the comfort of the old way of being in relationship with you. And yet, we know that you are calling us into new life, into new relationship, into new understandings. You are calling your church to be present in a way in the 21st century that maybe we didn't have to be in the 20th century. With people so disconnected around the world, you call upon us to be the bonding agent sometimes, to bring people together, to do community organizing around spiritual things, or just to be agents of calm, peace, generosity, kindness, just to be present and treat people well. Help us to do that. Help us to not be afraid of change, to recognize that we are part of a 500-year cycle, and it is right and it is good for humanity to evolve. And we are part of that. Our nation is part of it. The global community is part of it. Whether we embrace it, are aware of it, or not, it's still happening. Great God, we give thanks for people of insight, the prophets of our day, who share their ideas with us and prompt us to think and to be in new relationships with you in the world. And so we offer these prayers up to you, Jesus, and pray with one voice as you taught us to pray, saying, Our beloved God in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it already exists in heaven. Give us today all that we need, and forgive us for the things we do wrong as we forgive those who hurt or do wrong to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the time of trial. For in you we find your kingdom, your power, and your glory forever. Amen. So benedictions are final blessings to bless you on your way. Today, I invite you to ask God for your own individual blessing. To bless the work that you are in, to bless the people you associate with, the families you are a part of, either by ver uh, virtue of birth or choice. And to really understand that God goes with us, that Jesus walks with us, and that the Spirit upholds us, even when we are becoming the emergent church. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you back here next time, and of course throughout the week with prayerful pause with the pastor. I look forward to worshiping with you again. Until then, God bless. Take care. And... Bye for now.